to our series. This is going to take us into September. We're not setting a hard finish date uh, just because the variables that can come up. Uh, we have the Morleys coming on the 21st that will be here uh, so that we had to bump the schedule a week for that and we just want to leave room for what else is coming up. But here we are in the book of Joshua and I invite you to turn on your device or in your paper Bible. If, um, <laughs> there's one in the pew rack in front of you if you'd like one to Joshua chapter 3. That's where we are in our journey, and this message is uh, titled, Sure Footing, inspired by the passage of Scripture that towards the end, in fact, at the very end, you will see that as they had this water barrier in front of them, on, in verse uh, 17, I believe it is, it says, the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. So the water wasn't just parted, and they sloshed through the mud that just got exposed, but it, and slippery rocks but it was dry. There was sure footing for them to get where God was trying to get them to be. So we're going to learn some principles from that today as we walk through chapter 3. And we're going to look at a chunk and then glean from it what God wants for us today. Starting in chapter 3, verse 1. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you've never been this way before. Not a real deep truth. It didn't take a scholar for me to pull this out of the truth of this passage, but your blanks are, when God moves, follow. <laughs> when God moves, follow. The Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God. We know that God was not contained in that box of wood and gold gilding, beautiful, ornate sculptures. It was heavy, had some precious tools of God in it from the past as reminders. But it embodied and, and symbolized the very presence of God among them. And so as it moved, it symbolized the movement of God. And they said, when you see, move out of your positions this is for a little bit of fun. How many of you are sitting in the exact same seat that you've sat in the last three Sundays? <laughs> How many of you are sitting in the exact same seat you've sat in for the last 10 years? <laughs> and that's okay. It's okay. Uh, unless you come here a little later than normal and there's a visitor sitting in your seat, would you let them stay there, please, and not ask them to move? I've known that to happen. <laughs> Excuse me, you're in my seat. And I've known visitors who've got up and left instead of sitting somewhere else. Because there is a purpose that's bigger, and, and, and when we see God move, we need to follow. We need to get out of our positions. And, and my hope and prayer is that as we sit in the same seat in church, we're not in the same place spiritually that we were 10 years ago. That those around us aren't in the same place spiritually. Those under our influence aren't in the same place spiritually that we were three years ago, two years ago. So when God is moving, we need to be following, but we have to get out of our positions. You see, this was a nation that had gotten pretty good at setting up camp and got pretty good at tearing it down, too. But once you drive some stakes, you, you, you're not looking. How, how many of you have moved several times in your life, changing homes? Okay, It is a pain in the patootie, isn't it? Man, I spit when I said that. Yeah, I mean, it is. It's a pain in the patootie. We don't want to do it. But imagine if you had to tear your house down and stack the wood on a cart and move the house to the new location too. I mean, this is, this is what they had to do. This was not convenient. But when God moves, follow. And it says there, because then, if you follow God, then you will know which way to step, which way to go. Because you've never been that way, this way before. See, God wants to take us into new territory personally, spiritually. And he wants us to take new territory evangelistically in our world, that we are reaching the lost for him, that we're winning the Rahabs, the prostitutes who don't know any better, who see God so real in us that they come to faith and become part of God's people. Who are the Rahabs around you? 
and we cannot influence them if we stay in the same position spiritually that we are. How do we see God move? We don't have the Ark of the Covenant. It's so funny in our humanity how we are so finite and tangible that sometimes we wish we had this wooden chest with the gold gilding so that we could see with our human eyes, oh, it's on the move, and we can follow it. There it is. I see it right there. All right. And it just seems so easy to us. And the funny thing is, isn't it easier to follow a spirit within you, a living spirit, talking spirit within you that guides you? The very spirit of God himself, not this box that symbolizes his presence, but the presence of him in here, in here, following him, sensing him. But how do we see it? How do we know when he's moving? Many times in churches, it's going a certain, we we had district assembly and heard all these reports, and, and, and some people don't like what their church is doing as it's moving through its leadership. So how do we see when there's no ark? Well, we, I mentioned the Spirit of God. Personally, you, you set yourself up to see, sense, know what God wants to do when you know his word. Not here, but by the Spirit in here. We can know the words. I, I've used an illustration before of a guy that was in prison that all he had was a Bible. And, and he, the guys would walk by and see that he had it open every day. And, and when he finally died after his, his, the end of his, I mean, he was life in prison and he passed away, they go in there and, and what he had scratched and scrawled in some notes were things like, the word thou appears in the book of James 300 times. And, and this verse is the very middle verse of the Bible with an equal number of verses after an equal number before. And, and all this logistical stuff of the words and the text that he studied all his life and there wasn't one thing about coming to knowledge of Jesus Christ and the salvation that was available for him. We can read the words and know what it says, but God's word itself tells us the Holy Spirit of God must tell us the thoughts of God. So the word of God enabled by the Spirit of God gives us a vision, a view, a sense of his leading. He works through earthly leaders. He did through Joshua and Joshua through the officers. We start to look at what the dynamics of this really was and the scope of this miracle. But we're going to see that Joshua had to send his officers to tell the people because it had to trickle out. Just like Jesus had to communicate to 5,000, 5,000 could not hear his voice. Even though he was in a great place for it to be projected, there were, they had people that would listen and pass on and listen and pass on and listen and pass on. Now we're looking at evangelizing the world. We need to listen and pass on. We need to listen and pass on this guidance of him. But the spiritual leaders, and I know there are spiritual leaders that lead people crazy. Televangelists, Jim Jones, people that may start out legit, that get caught in the traps of what can be, that fall. And then it's easy in the context of other settings to just not trust leaders. It's easy easy for you to not trust me as a man. I'm a man. I fall short of God's glory. I'm not perfect. (laughs) I know that. And yet God wants us to have a measure of trusting leaders. It's one of the ways that he leads us. He spoke to Joshua. Joshua had to obey God. And if Joshua obeyed God, And what he passed on to his officers was what the people, in essence, God was speaking to the people through Joshua, through the officers, through to them, and them to their kids. Come on, time to pack up the tent. Let's pull up the stakes. But also he leads through doors. Sometimes we, you know, he opens some doors, he closes some doors. And so there's sometimes those kinds of ways that God leads. But we are more sensitive to those when we're in the word through the spirit and listening to godly leaders. And I encourage you, be in a place where you can not trust the perfection of the leaders, but trust their heart. Trust their heart. And I do my best to be a man that you can trust my heart. But I can't trick you. I can only do that by listening and passing on. 
So I do my best. But those are ways that God leads. When God moves, follow. Verse 4, the second half of that verse, we only read the first half, but keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits. So when you see it move, follow it, but keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits, which is over half of a mile. That's about 57% of a mile. I got on the calculator, so it is 57%. So keep about a half mile between you and the ark. Do not go near it. Uh, that's just, now we know the ark symbolized the power of God that when it was in the Holy of Holies, only the chief priest could go in for once a year on behalf of the people. And, uh, and that power, and God would, God would manifest himself in line with that power and that symbolism as well. And, and so there's that awe, there's that respect. There's also that distance that let, lets God do what he's going to do and that no one sees anybody else to do anything that can get any credit for it but God. And, and yet, and also when we look at the dynamics, your next blank is, you know what? Trust God to work in ways you can't see. Trust God to work in ways you can't see. He's working behind the scenes all the time. You know, not only did they have this half a mile of distance, you get a half a mile from something, it's hard to see it already, especially for me and Brother Ernie, getting older. But then there was, we, we look at this, the magnitude of the crowd that was staying a half a mile back. Was they, The scripture said they had about 600,000 fighting men. And I've read some estimates that when you kind of just consider a rough estimate of wives and children and, and, and non-fighting age or condition men, 2.5 million people. If that's a little rough this way or that way, it doesn't matter. It's a good ballpark for us. Not counting cattle, sheep, whatever herds, whatever carts and tents and, and, and steaks and, and pots and pans or whatever they, they had, internet servers, whatever they had, their computers. That's a big crowd. I could not get two, we could not get 2.5 million people in this room. We could not get 2.5 million people on this property. We could, get, could not get 2.5 million people on this block, I think. I don't know. It'd be interesting to try. And if we did, who would be able to see me? How many of that, what percentage of that group would be able to see me or see the ark if that's what we had here? You, the people had to trust and follow. And when they saw what they saw, when they heard what they heard, through God's leadership chain to them, they followed. But we need to trust God to work in ways we cannot see. We need to trust when we're looking at reaching our world and reaching the lost that don't know Christ and you don't think you know enough. Sometimes we have to trust what we call the prevenient grace of God. There's denominations divided over their understanding of prevenient grace. Some thinking that it means God has chosen them to be saved and they can't avoid it. We just are the trigger that gets them there. We believe that the prevenient grace of God is the Holy Spirit of God going before us as he wants all men to be saved, wooing to all men and women, and, and that his the divine qualities can be seen in what's been created, Scripture tells us. But because men don't acknowledge him as God, then his wrath is against mankind. And the God of this age has blinded the eyes of unbelievers, and, and we are there to be salt. We have to come to be salt and light. But we never know what God is doing in someone's heart before we get there. Annette, Annette Morley said it on the video. I had to type in this note when they were thinking of going to this people in this religiously confused place. And we think of missionaries taking God to people. And she said, we don't, we realize we don't take God anywhere. He's already there. A bunch of us from Oakdale went to Joplin after the tornadoes. The tornadoes were so huge. It was the swath of devastation through that little town was just amazing. There were seven tornadoes inside the main tornado. So it was like a multi-head razor shaving the ground. Cars a mile away from where they were. Bodies miles away from where they were. 
and we went there. We, we picked up stakes. We got there before the National Guard. They were just starting to come in with the military vehicles to start to kind of secure the place and start to bring in the bulldozers and start doing this big, massive thing where they were going to limit access. And we pulled in with, with dump trucks and, and bulldozers and you know, front-end loaders and guys in my church that God laid on their heart, and they paid for all of us to go and stay and, and work. And it was amazing. We didn't know what we were going to face. We were prepared with camping equipment to stay in the hills. There wasn't places to stay. There was a Christian college that one of the guys' uh, family was a part of, and we got to stay. The men slept on the chapel floor, and the women went in some of the dorm rooms. So God prepared some of that. But the people that we met, God was there. And he led us to people And he even brought people with us that we didn't know we would need. And we didn't even know we had those assets with us. Just one little example was, of course, some of the homes that had partial damage and and, uh, some of that destruction were up in the attic and and the eaves through the soffits being uh, compromised. And so their HVAC systems were compromised and and it was miserable. And and there were so many, I mean, there was so much devastation. So we were cleaning up and we saw so many things I don't have time to go into except for the cross of Christ that was standing in the middle of town because one of the churches had a big I-beam suspension cross that was left standing, almost like at 9-11. There was this big cross on the highest point in this flat town that was just standing in all this devastation. But we get these requests from people that found out we were there, and, and they'd say, I got, I got this, do you? you know? and, and at our evening meeting, Richard would just come up and say, here's some of the requests we got, and here's this one family. And one of the guys said, oh, that's what I do for a living. We didn't even know that. God had prepared us and took us right where we needed to be. There were many, many instances like that. So trust God to be working in ways you can't see. I'm getting too excited and belaboring this. So we trust the prevenient grace and we trust the inspiration of leaders in the body movement. Why are they doing what they're doing? Many times we're quick to think because we don't like it, it must be spiritually weak. We're, we're watering ourselves down. We're, we're, deme- we're, we're, we're de- reducing the value. of. We're re- no, no. God called leaders want to be as powerful as they can be. And, and, and so when just we, it, it tends to be sometimes that we spiritualize the things we don't like so we can give good criticism that seems spiritual. And... and Sometimes the leaders are not spiritual and they're trying to fill their pocket. I know that's true in our world. But we must trust the inspiration of leaders because God's speaking to them through input, through a vision of oversight that no one else has as, as there's input, there's studies, there's time spent in looking at who we're trying to reach. There's time spent in seminars and conferences and some of them are garbage, I know. But there's times with those hearts that want to reach this world and and take new territory for the kingdom that come with this inspiration of God. And just because we don't like it doesn't make it not spiritual. And yet many times, well, I I think we're just not being spiritual. We're watering down. Just want to encourage us. We're going to take this new land together. Don't trust an individual. Trust God. And, and the way he wants to lead us and trust that he's working in ways that you can't see. Many times, like I said, you want to see that Ark of the Covenant move. You want to see it right there. And, okay, now I know how to follow it. I, I knew one individual, this is so much extra gravy. I knew one individual that in one of my churches that when we removed the big heavy sacred desk called a pulpit, the big wooden boom, boom, I couldn't even reach the sides of it with my arms. We put, pulled that out and put a little pulpit up here and, and, you know, I can understand the experience, and yet I know that God doesn't want that bondage to be still there. He wanted that pulpit there because he had a pastor that he seemed to, to know was not ethically or morally legit. And he had a hard time receiving God's word from him. And this is in his perspective, and I don't know all the facts. But when, it, when the word was, when the pastor, the human being vessel was behind that big desk, he could separate the words out of the Bible that he was preaching from the man that he knew. And he needed this big chunk of wood to validate God's word. Now, maybe for a season, that's okay. But do you think God wants him to need a big chunk of wood to receive his word? (laughs) And so we can get stuck 
in those things, even from real experiences, and they will become cumbersome. We've got our own tents, our own children, our own animals. We've got our own stuff to move when God moves. We can't be taking a big old sacred desk on our shoulders, too. We can't be taking, there's nothing, we don't need to take extra baggage from these past experiences. God moves, let go, take the essentials, and let's move. Verse 5, Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. I believe we as a church are right there. That as we are setting ourselves apart and we follow this journey with, through Joshua and learn from it and, and follow as God leads through it, that God is going to do amazing things among us. Does anybody want that? I want to see it. I want my kids to see it. You know how amazing it would be if we were double the size in a year? And you know that that only takes one of you, each one of you getting one person to start learning about God with us? In a whole year, it just takes each one of you getting one more person to come and learn about God with us, join this journey with us, and we're double in size. When we just say it, it sounds amazing and impossible. When we see how we can get there, uh uh-uh. We follow God, and he will do amazing things. And so the blanks are prepare in expectancy. Sometimes we get used to sitting in the same seat and having the same empty seats next to me. We get used to the vision of it. Oh, there's about five or ten more people here than usually. It looks pretty good. And our gauge of what's amazing and what's good is different. Or get used to waiting for the platform to make the bells and whistles that gets everybody in here. We know bells and whistles are superficial, folks, and we want to do everything we can, as I've said. But the Holy Spirit's the only bell and whistle we need. He's the one who wants to transform lives with a good news of the gospel. Pluck them from a journey towards hell forever into a journey of fulfillment in who they are, ending in a never-ending place called heaven. Raleigh said it at District Assembly. We've got the best message in the whole world. And we're afraid to share it. But we've got to expect when God's moving and taking us somewhere, we've got to prepare in expectancy. Consecrate yourselves. We've got to be ready to drive. You know, we want to drive some stakes in the ground. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm driving that stake in the ground. Who I'm going to be in my character by God. I'm going to drive some stakes in the ground, and those are going to be anchors for me, for those things that I want to be a part of my life. But I've got to pull up stakes to move and go as who God's making me to be where he wants me to be. There's a reason why he's making me who he wants me to be. Number one, for my own good and his joy of pouring that into me. And number two, that others see that and want to be in a relationship with him as well. We've got to drive, up, drive down stakes, but pulling up stakes, ready to move, ready to let that visitor stay in your seat if they happen to get there before you. That's just a little symbol of the idea that we're talking about. And also... Scripture tells us, be prepared with an answer for the hope that you have. Be prepared with an answer. Do you have your testimony? I mean, really, the testimony is simple. What, what, what did you used to be like? What happened? Like, how did you meet Christ? How did you come to give your life to Christ? And how dif- what's the difference now? That's a testimony. What were you like before? How did you meet Christ? What's, a, what's the difference That's a testimony of the difference that God makes in your life, and every follower has a powerful, powerful testimony. It also denotes to me that people are going to notice something and ask you about it. I've I've not had enough people come up and say, what is it about you, Peyton? You got something different. You almost died, you, you know, when you, were, when you were almost dying. You're in the hospital. You know, I'm hoping that there was a peace. I prayed for nurses. I prayed with one nurse in particular that asked me to. Well, I'm laying there, and she's having to change my bedpan because I couldn't move with this blood clot. And they had to do things that were so undignified because to keep me dignified. And yet they're asking for me to pray for them. And so in whatever situation we're in, how are we, how are we being consecrated for God? 
and showing that difference that he makes. We've got to move on. Joshua, verse, uh, verses 6 through 8. Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. It may seem a little obscure pulling out of this, but your next blanks are lead well by following well. You have influence over others in your life. There, I don't think there's anyone sitting in this place that doesn't have someone that they have some influence with, especially if it's your own children, spouse, co-workers. You're in a position to influence their life. You may not be their leader, their manager, but if you are Christian and they're not, you are a leader in that regard. They need to go somewhere they don't know yet. And you know a little bit more of it. And we lead well by following well. Joshua turned and instructed others as God told him to. Joshua followed God well. And so his leadership was well followed. And those who followed him followed his leadership and the people followed them. And, and it really, there's no one who exists who does not have someone that they need to follow. There's no human being that does not have someone they need to follow. I've shared with you before, I'm not going to get into the detail, but there was a time when I disagreed with, in the local dynamic of what a district superintendent was wanting me to do. And I went to the office and I spoke with him, with my church board secretary, and we tried to convince him and, and help him see our side. And he still stood firm, gave good reasoning why, and I had to go back to my board and say, you know what, we have to do this because I'm still concerned about these dynamics, but this is the right thing to do because my leadership has told me to. And God took care. God took care. We have people that we, we, need, we need to be able to follow God. We need to follow leaders in order to have people follow us. We lead well by following, number one, God. <laughs> don't, get, you know, don't be too dangerous. Jim Jones had people follow him to a horrible end. So we know that there's care. But if you know the Spirit of God, you will be able to catch those counterfeits and, and follow well. So you had God that led Joshua Joshua followed God and led the priests. The priests followed Joshua and led the people. And all I know is that even if I struggle with what the leadership, God's word says no one's in authority except whom God has placed there. Pray for them. And respect and obey your authorities. We know there's a place for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? We know that we're not going to worship another god at anyone's command just because they're the earthly power. But there comes a place of submission to that in our lives and all I know is each of us me you we are accountable for how we follow God and how we follow according to his word in his chain of command again there were approximately 2.5 million people plus animals in this group that you know they had to follow when the ark of the covenant moved not all of them saw it visually with their own eyes the kids saw their parents start moving oh time to go Brothers saw brothers moving. Oh, they're, okay. There was someone up ahead who saw the ark and started moving. I wonder how many times someone had to go to the bathroom tent and everybody ended up following them there thinking it was time to move. But whole nations surrounding the bathroom tent. I don't know. But, but there, people had to follow people. And sure, there were voices that were coming down. It's moving. It's on the move. It's moving. Let's go. I'm sure there were commands with it as well. So faithful in a true chain of command is essential. And everyone in that is accountable. Everyone. And you are a pastor to somebody. You may not be called pastor of a church to equip the saints for works of service, but you are called to be in works of service to pastor to people, to minister to people. And all of us are a part of that. We need to follow a faithful and true chain of command, and we need to be a faithful and true chain of command to those behind us. Next passage, 
Joshua said to the Israelites, this is verse 9 through 10, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. My goodness. The Burpasites. I wish that was there the last Sunday when I burped. Um, Joshua said, come and hear the word, and this is how you will know that he is among you. In our journey... Starting now, and as it goes along, we will need to remember God's power and faithfulness. Because it strikes me that Joshua is telling this people that have come out of the desert, they have seen water come out of a rock, they have seen bread form on the ground, they have seen quail drop from the sky in the desert. They know what God did at the Red Sea from their ancestors. They have seen God do incredible things, cloud by day, fire by night, phenomenal stuff, and he's having to sit here and say, you're not sure God's among us? Let's, here, let's listen so we can, here's how you're going to know that he's among us. You don't know it already? <laughs> Come on, Israel! Well, Israel is us, folks. We have those tendencies what Satan can do to us is he can get us to forget the miracles of the past and think, what's you going to do for me next? What have you done for me lately, God? Or he can get us to try to dwell in the miracles of the past. God's done with me. I was sanctified 20 years ago. And now I'm petrified, sitting in the same seat, doing the same thing. We have to remember God's power and his faithfulness, and we are on a journey. And Israel had all those things they could look back on. But Joshua was about to tell them, okay, he's going to do some things yet among us that you will know. He's going to keep working in ways that only he can work, and you're going to know that he is among us. And so in the journey, we need to step out now, taking some time to remember what he's brought us from, remembering his power, and his faithfulness, even as we face a new river at flood stage that seems to overwhelm us, we don't know how to get through it. Where are you, God? Well, we still have the Red Sea and the water from a rock and the bread on the ground and the quail on the ground and the cloud by day and the the fire by... We still have all that to remember God's power and his faithfulness. It's a journey, and he got us here to get us there, wherever there is to the next phase of our own growth and as a ministry, as a church. And and God has great days for us. He's going to do some things in the future that we will know he is among us. We need to move on. Verses 11 to 14. See the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, and we'll get more from those guys next week. Choose 12 from the men of Israel and from each tribe, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the ark of the covenant went ahead of them. Nike time. Next blank. Just do it. Just do it. The man leader Joshua said, God's going to do these great things. When this happens, all this is going to happen. And many could go, well, that seems kind of whack there, Joshua. What did you smoke in your tent last night, Joshua? I don't know. I'll wait and see, you know. But here we see, here's this guy says, you know what? God's going to do these things and all this water is going to, it's at flood stage. You see what it is. But when you take this step of faith, it's going to pile up in a heap and the people (laughs) broke camp. Pulled up stakes, rolled up the tents, put them on the cart. They had no place to stay after that in this where they were. They were committed, and they just broke camp and started heading. There goes the ark, and here we go. Just do it. They just did it. And so that's all i got to say about that. Let's move on. Verses 15 to 16. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark... Now, wait a minute. I just want to stop, and I want to take advantage of a trick that Pastor Matt gave us when he preached. Take yourself there. 
Close your eyes. Many of you, I'm sure, have been camping in, along rivers or streams. Listen to the sound of the incredibly fast rushing water. Picture white water. The closer you get, you're feeling the mist of the spray, of the water dashing upon the rocks, the foam. And as you get closer to the banks, that moisture has the mud on the side of the river a little slippery. And the rocks, slippery. Just put yourself there. As soon as the priest who carried this heavy, gold-gilded chest, the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge. The water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan. While the water flowing down to the Sea of Araba, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. Did you see that water part? All of us know you slip into something like that, you are in peril. God's timing is amazing because we have, our Wednesday night group has started watching the video series of Dr. Vanderlaan in the Holy Land. We're going to the places where these happen. And last Wednesday, we were at the Jordan talking about this story. And one of the things he says, and you, I think you may hear it in this clip, but I want you to also get your bookmark first. I want you to get your bookmark. Get it ready. Oh, I didn't say the point. The blank is step out in faith. Fill in your blank. Step out in faith. For the priests were where you were in your mind. In fact, it, we're going to learn it was a little bit more treacherous than that slippery, muddy slope. It, it was beyond that. Because the way, and I'm not sure it's in the clip, so I'll say it, the way the river flowed at the place where they crossed, the banks were steep. There was no stepping in at a gradual shore. It was a steep cut thing that when you stepped in, you were both feet all the way committed. There was no control yourself and touch like this like testing the cold water in a pool. It wasn't like that. And the Jordan by itself, when it's not flood stage, is one of the fastest flowing rivers in the world because the change of elevation and gravity's effect on it, because the Dead Sea is the Dead Sea because of how low in elevation it's the lowest sea. And so the river that is flowing is coming down a gravity-pulled drop in elevation that makes it the fastest naturally flowing water as far as the speed of the water, no matter how much it is, it's already one of the fastest. Then you take that and put it at flood stage. And you know what? We picture the Jordan just being this like, whoa, huge. You're going to see it. And, and it is dammed up today. And, and there is a little bit of control. They use the water for hydroelectric power. They, they keep the water for desalination or whatever. Not out of the river. It wouldn't be des desalinized. But they, use, they, they dam it up for their uses. And, and so it's a little bit different, but not much wider than it would have been back in Bible times. The, the amount of water may be less, but the width is not less. But I want you to look at your bookmarks now, and you'll see under there, the, the third one, I think, is my Jordan. What is God wanting you to cross that looks like it's at flood stage? And you're afraid. And he wants you to step into it first. And there's a land of abundance. Yes, there's still more challenges, but a land of abundance on the other side of his deliverance. It may be an addictive pattern. I don't know what it is. Whatever it is, is actually an idol that's keeping us from worshiping God to the fullest and obeying him to the fullest. So I want you to think about what is my Jordan and we'll, we'll come back to these bookmarks, but I want you to watch and listen to Dr. Vanderlaan. We have, have a few minutes uh, of a tape from him at the Jordan. You'll get to see it. Let's watch. Coming out of the desert, there's sheep, there are people, large numbers of people, and they're waiting. In between them is a barrier. 
The barrier, I think, in that culture represented a couple of things. One, the citizens of Jericho and of Canaan worshipped the fertility gods, particularly Baal. Now, what is Baal the god of? Well, sure enough, water, rain, storm, wind, thunder, lightning, depths of the water. And we read in Joshua chapter 3 that the river was at flood stage at that time. So in a sense, to the Canaanite at least, and the Jericho person like Rahab and her family, that river represented at that moment the fact that they were shielded from the Israelite by their God. We're protected. He's, he's protecting us. And the dividing of the Jordan River was a powerful way that God made a declaration that he was stronger, not just than nature, but he was stronger than the gods of the culture. But here's the faith lesson. God says to Joshua, I'll divide the river. It's my power. What stands between you and your calling in life, what stands between you and what I want to do through you, I'll take care of it. But nothing will happen until you put your foot in the water. Now, what you need to appreciate is that it was not a matter of they stood like this on a nice slope and touched one foot down in the water. But due to the nature of the way the Jordan River runs there, when you step in, you're in. And once those priests stepped in, they were either going to be in over their heads or the river was going to divide. Now, if I'd have been one of those priests, I'd have been thinking, God, I'm going to stand right here. You take care of the river, I'll be the first one to the other side. If they would have said that, theoretically, that whole nation would still be standing there on the bank. But what loosed, if you will, the power of God was at the moment that they said, God, to live or to die, we've got to make a commitment. And they stepped in over their heads, and they were in, and boom, power of God divides the river. God acts often when people are willing to make that total commitment. And it seems to me that the first step we need to take as followers of those Jewish people in our tradition is we need to be willing to say, God, my life is out there ahead of me. You've called me to all kinds of ministry. I don't even know for sure what it is. But instead of standing here till my life is all together and you've divided every barrier and I can just walk into my life, I think what we need to say is, God, I'm going to make a total commitment to you. I'm going to step in. I'm yours. What's my Jordan? I titled that uh, clip, First Steps a Doozy. What is your Jordan today? We see in that that as much as we want to see the impressive width of the river, and we kind of go, well, that's not that wide. I mean, okay, it's still a miracle, but if it was the Hudson River, then that, oh, boy, that would be impressive. It was a symbol of his lordship over idols, that the Canaanites believed in a god, lowercase g, of water and fertility, they had those little statues on their hearth and their home that they would pray to them, hoping their harvest would be strong. Israel started mixing in some of those. They'd, they'd have those on their hearth in their home, but they'd go to the temple, and that's what God would get mad at them about many times over as they mixed the gods of the culture with their faith, trying to cover all their bases. Well, he mentions in here that Israel all through the desert had how many miracles of water? Water from a rock, parting the Red Sea, parting the Jordan, God's command over. It was the dew of the morning, desert dew that turned into bread for life. But here you had this whole foreign land that you are afraid of, and they think that their gods are protecting them. And the water at flood stage, even in that unimpressively wide river, when it's at flood stage, oh, Baal's working. There's 2.5 million people over there wanting to come get us, and look what Baal's doing. <laughs> and God goes, boop. <laughs> what about your God now? How's that working for you? Because it may not be that impressive in how wide it was, in what our memories or our thoughts may take it, 
You know that it was estimated when we look at where some of the, the places geographically that are associated, the, the city of Adam is not well known where it is. It's not certain. And yet some of the associated words and places with it, they've estimated that it was about a 16-mile stretch of river that was dry. 16 miles this way. Because <laughs> 2.5 million people would take a little while to get through what we picture in our mind. <laughs> It was huge. So as far as the Canaanites could see, no water, not a drop, dry ground. Baal is toast. What is your Baal? But today, what is your Jordan that God wants to part in a miraculous way? Because anything that we allow us, stop us in God's leading us when he says, I move, follow, and we find a reason not to follow. Whatever that reason is, is an idol. It is a Baal. And God is the God, the one true living God. And it does take total commitment. Heavenly Father, as we look at these, these bookmarks and use these tools in our journey, I just pray right now for each one of us that even by the sweet horribly beautiful honesty of your Holy Spirit that you would speak to us of what our Jordan is what are we standing on the bank of and waiting for you to part before we take safe passage and what are you calling us to commit first in faith and trust that you are the God who goes before us who's been behind us who's provided in power, who loves me so much he'd die for me, who has an eternity for me. So even if I die following you, I don't die. I graduate sooner. How do I trust you and step all in? I just pray you speak to each one of us and have us write down what right now in our journey is my Jordan. And while your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, your Jordan may be that you've never received Jesus Christ as your, your Savior in the first place. You've been too afraid of what really following, becoming a disciple of Christ is going to be. I can believe in him. I can visit a church and, and applaud this God, but really giving my life to him, I'm still not even sure. Your, your bail might be doubt that this gospel message is true. What is it? Well, if you want to, if you want to, you've heard the Holy Spirit, he's speaking to you today, and it's ringing with truth, and you want to receive Jesus as your Savior, we can't be led by him. We can't be led by his Spirit. We can't have the Word of God inspire us. We can't develop trust in his leaders. We can't develop trust in him to lead, even through humans. We can't develop that implicit trust in him unless we know him, and when we've trusted him directly. And so you may need to first give your life to him, and, and all you got to do is Confess that you've lived your own life. Confess your sins, and he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and, and come into your heart. And you invite him to come in and, and that you'll follow him. Anyone in here that needs to do that first step today, that your Jordan has been there in front of you, and you've just never taken that step of saying, God, I admit I'm a sinner, and I believe that you love me, that you died for me, and I want to ask you to forgive me, come into my heart. Is there anyone here who needs to say that today for the first time? You won't get anywhere in the journey. You can make it look pretty good, but you'll not get anywhere fulfilling in the journey until you take that first step. Anyone in here that needs to do that, give your life to Christ. How many of you would just say, Pastor, God showed me what my Jordan is, and I just want to let you know when you pray for us. How many of you had something to write on your Jordan? What's your Jordan? Let me see. Anybody? Just one? Just two people? And three? Oh, folks, this is not just an exercise, and maybe you're still praying. The whole nation's got to go together. Lord, I just pray that you will lead and guide and expose our Jordans to us. We cannot make a total commitment to step in until we see what it is we need to step into. 
We need to know that you're leading. We need to know that you're moving. And I know, Father, but I pray against the spirit of fear right now and that you will call your people as a whole to allow you to speak their fear of the next step into their own life. And for those who raise their hand, I thank you. I thank you that you have spoken through your spirit to them. And, and I pray you give them the courage. Bolster their faith. Let them remember your power and your faithfulness. And take that step. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. You know, Samuel said to Saul, who was anointed king by God's command. And Saul had rebelled and did not follow he started following and he stopped following and Samuel had to say to him for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry and I just have been called of God to share the whole truth to stay on the bank of the river when God is calling us to cross is no better than witchcraft. To stay comfortable in our faith and where we're at in our walk with God is as bad as witchcraft. It's rebellion. When God says move and follow and we don't, that's what Samuel said to him. <laughs> Rebellion is just like witchcraft. You, you have all these horrible sins that we yell at in our culture, and we're not obeying God ourselves. We're no better. Church, we must follow. Next, the priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. So your next blank is simply this, pursue the purpose of the miracle. Pursue the purpose of the miracle. Here's an old riddle for you. Why did the Israelites cross the Jordan? To get to the other side. But why? Because on the other side, yet to move still to get to is a Jericho. And I, the land of I, and the Amorites. And, 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 and if... The, if they just wanted to stand in the miracle of the river and go, wow, look what God's done. Look at this water. Look, I can't even see water. Well, I, as far as I can see, there's no water. Look what God's doing. And it's so awesome. And God's doing this great thing. We want to stay right there. I want to stay in the miracle. But God's, God's saying, and we're going to see later, that that water is closed up. So if you tried to stay in that miracle, you're in a little bit of trouble. But he, the Jordan's cross, I mean, the Israelites crossed the Jordan to get to the other side and to get to Jericho beyond it and to get to Ai. And they had a battle against the Amorites we're going to get to where the sun stands still for a day. Do you know that? God extends a whole day so Israel has time to defeat their enemy. Eddie, you want God to extend the day sometimes with the hours of work you're putting in at the stadium? Jennifer, you want God to extend the day, hours in the day so he can be home some of them? <laughs> I mean, how many times, you know what, it, we get all this internet and stuff to make us do things faster and we just pack more stuff in. We don't get done faster and have more time with our family. We're more stressed getting more done in, in the same amount of time. And, and, and yet here, here God is saying, you know what, I got a purpose for miracles in your life. And what God has done in your past, don't stew in them, don't sit in them, don't, don't make it your pew that you sit in in the same spot all the time. I parted these waters, not so you could sit here and, glory, and, and, and celebrate it. I parted these waters so you could go take the new land from further than you can see from here is waiting for you. And so every miracle, there's a purpose, and we must pursue that purpose that they crossed on dry ground to the other side. They completed the crossing. They got to the other side. That's why God parted the waters. And they did it on sure footing. What a miracle, as we've said. What a testimony against the gods of the culture. 16 miles of dry ground in a, what was two seconds ago, flood stage river. Wham. Folks, I just want to tell you as your pastor... Consecrate yourselves today. For tomorrow, God is going to do amazing things among us. Let's believe 
Let's step together. Let's walk together. Let's obey together. Heavenly Father, as we come to you, we're coming to your table today, and our children have come in to join us so our families can have communion together. And what a picture. Those of us who were in this room before they came in need to follow you well so those who came in just now can be led well. And we're going to next week look at how we let the generations after us know what you have done. But here as we've crossed the Jordan today, in come our children. And we come to your table that you left for us, that you said, when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And so we take communion today because the generation before us passed it on to us. In many cases, it's passed on as ritual. It's done in Jewish culture as tradition without the fulfillment of Christ and their understanding, faithfully and ritualistically. And Father, I pray that today as Matt comes to lead us in communion, that it will be us truly remembering your power and your faithfulness to face the Jordan you're calling us in our own life and as a church to reach our culture to cross. So be with Matt as he leads us in the elements of communion today. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Can I have the ushers come up, please? I just wanted to share with you this morning a passage that we've been studying with the uh, children in uh, Sunday school, our Sunday school class. It comes from John chapter 8, starting in verse 31. And it says this, To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Verse 33, they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I just was thinking about that as pastor was talking about God providing this way for, for the Israelites to get to that promised land, to cross that river, to cross that, that river at flood stage. And, and I'm in this class right now where we're studying the, the book of Exodus this week. And it talks about Jesus as this new Exodus for us. That our God is a God of liberation and freedom. And just like this passage says in John, as, as Jesus said himself, he wants to set you free. I want you to know that today, church. He wants to set you free. He loves you so much. The Son himself wants to set you free. 
and then you will be free indeed. So I'm thinking about that as, as we're thinking about communion and the sacrifice that he gave us, that God set us free, willingly on the cross, rising again to overcome sin and death. So we remember that night where he took that bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, this is the body that will be broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup. He lifted up the cup and blessed it. He said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, the blood that will be shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for the freedom that you give us over sin. For the freedom that you give us to overcome those things in our lives, those, those Jordans, those rivers that we don't see possible. But God, we know with you all things are possible. God, today as we remember your resurrection, your victory over sin and death. We just want to thank you for that reminder of the greatest love that has ever been known to man. We love you so much, Jesus. Let us live that love out this week. Let the light that you give us shine so much that all others can do is glorify the Father in heaven. We thank you for this time this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Be still, there is a healer. His love is deeper than the sea. His mercy is unfailing. His arms are fortress for the weak. Let faith arise, let faith arise, now lift my hands to believe again, you are my refuge, you are my strength, as I pour out my heart, these things I remember. You are faithful, God, forever. Be still, there is a river that flows from Calvary. Mountain for the thirsty, your grace that washes over me. Let faith arise, let faith arise. Now lift my head to believe again. You are my refuge. As I pour out my heart, these things I remember, you are faithful God forever. Let faith arise, let faith arise, open my eyes, open my eyes, let faith arise, let faith arise, open my eyes. Open my eyes I lift my hands to believe again You are my refuge, you are my strength As 
Have a blessed week.